Well, we are in uh, our message series through the book of Galatians, as Bible Mike let us know. We are in Galatians, uh, we'll be in Galatians 1 today, if you have your Bible with you. If you don't have your Bible, the scriptures will be on the screen here in just a moment. The, 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 I've called the series, Tear Down the Walls. We just sang, Break Down the Walls of All My Religion. <laughs> and then we said, I give you permission. The book of Galatians is Paul writing and saying, hey, God had broken down some walls and now you're trying to rebuild them again. And here's the important thing. The gospel is the thing that moves us together. So we'll jump in. (laughs) Let's see, right at the beginning of Galatians, I, I think I put the wrong reference at the top of this, but this is actually Galatians 1, 6 through 7. So we can read a little bit of Paul's urgency right at the beginning of this letter. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, he says, which is really not another, he says. It's not a gospel. Gospel means good news. We're going to talk about this here in a moment. He said, so what you're trading out for is not good news. Which is really not another. Only there are some disturbing you and want, who want to distort the gospel of Christ. Hmm. So this is really, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a corrective letter. It is. And I told you last week, there's even sarcasm in it. At one point, I think it's in chapter three, he says, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Strong language because he knows that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that is gonna bring healing to this world and we should not allow it to become distorted. So the Apostle Paul, he, he built with people. Peter says that the, the early followers of Jesus were living stones. Jesus talked about the kingdom that he is building with and his people. Paul did not build with bureaucracies or temples, <laughs> but he built with people. He invested the good news of Jesus Christ into a people, and then he would leave to establish a new people, a new community, a church, we would call it. We, that's what we call it. And he, he would move on. So that's what, exactly what Paul did in the region of Galatia that he's writing this letter to. <laughs> new Jesus-formed communities began in this region of Galatia. We'll talk more about that. And they began to flourish and expand in Antioch of Poseidon, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Then Paul left. So that's, that's what is happening here. And Galatians is his letter writing back to them about three years later. And it's corrective. And he's, he is warning them. And it's, it's, it's fairly intense. And listen, as, we, as I go through this book, my heart, I think what Jesus wants to do is to show us that it is really important for us to have a corrective too that there are easily false gospels that warm their way in and distort the good news of Jesus Christ. So as we read Paul writing to the Galatians, let's read Paul and the Holy Spirit speaking to us as well. Is that okay? Yeah. We just said, we sang, I give you permission. (laughs) Did we mean it or not? You know, so we'll let the scriptures really take us. So in order to understand, I want to weave this illustration in order to understand the strength of Paul's correcting letter, let's think of an imaginary scenario, which actually could be very legitimate. Let's go to Tennessee in 18... <laughs> so people are like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> the volunteers, right? Tennessee volunteers. Isn't that yeah, the, the voles, as they're called? Yeah. Let's go to Tennessee. The year is 1857. Now, Tennessee was mostly of the South, but uh, right, it also had a lot of influence from the North. Trevor, is this where you're from, Tennessee? Yeah. All right, now I'm talking about your state. I don't know. Yeah, so forgive me <laughs> as I get it wrong. That's how you say it, right, Tennessee? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Just, I want you to know I didn't spell it right the first time when I was writing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mississippi, Tennessee, they just throw a lot of consonants <laughs> in, in the middle. Yeah, okay. Now, let's, let's imagine, 1857, this is a few years before the Civil War, that... I were to go and build a community of Jesus followers that were living up to the declaration of the independence, of independence, that all people are created equal and endowed by a creator with certain unalienable rights. 
Let's, let's imagine that's happening. That people in this community were beginning to be equal. That women had equal rights. The women say, yeah. Okay, some of you are like, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're not, it's a nine o'clock crowd. There we go. <laughs> Let's imagine there's no slaves. All were free. Black, white, beginning to live in harmony because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The walls were torn down. Let's imagine that. The rest of the nation didn't have that hope. But it was there, we're imagining, living there because of Jesus Christ. Now imagine I leave and a few years later, I receive word that some leaders have warmed their way into the community that I built on the gospel of Jesus Christ and telling others that black people are really only three fifths of a person. That only people who own property can have a say and that people need to be segregated and they're not even meeting together anymore. And there's this tiered approach that is weaving in. Can you imagine how upsetting and disappointing that would be? Yeah, you can. And then imagine with me, the nation goes into chaos, attempting to answer the questions of equality and dignity. They're trying to answer it through vicious violence. 54,000 Tennesseans join the Union Army and 100,000 Tennesseans joined the Confederate Army. And for the next five years, they proceed to kill each other. The most recent estimates say that 750,000 soldiers died in the Civil War. And then the so-called peace is a tenuous agreement after that that would supposedly free the slaves but would impede the progress of a whole race of people as the limping nation sought to rebuild. Don't you think that I would go back, want to go back to these people that I had built a relationship with in 1857 and proclaim to them and remind them that the only unifying principle that can tear down all these walls is Jesus Christ? Wouldn't you want to go back? When I want you to go back and proclaim, listen, who has bewitched you, Tennesseans? Who has bewitched you? The purity of the gospel has been distorted. He's the one that can unify you through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He tore down these false walls of separation. Wouldn't you want to go back? Absolutely. Now, history is what has happened. And it is easy for us to think what happened needed to have happened or couldn't be avoided. But listen, listen to this. In 1860, there were 52,000 churches in the United States. For every 14 soldiers who died, there was a church. And embedded into every single one of those churches was this message that Paul had wrote. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. It was there. Did 750,000 Soldiers need to die. It was there. There were 52,000 churches. And now, granted, there were many in the abolitionist movement who were energized and animated by this message. So it wasn't that all churches weren't proclaiming that message. But there were many that had lost that. Why? Because... The gospel had to been tied to other false hopes and other aspects that made it be a false gospel. The economy. The South couldn't see beyond their economic need to move forward. And so the gospel had been tied to that. And even some of them had gave the slaves what was called a slave Bible, which took out portions of scripture like this so that it wouldn't incite a rebellion, so they wouldn't recognize their own dignity that's given to them by God. The gospel was tied to a national dream. 
The nation had to kill itself for the sake of this gospel attached to the national identity, which is all enmeshed with manifest destiny and white Europeans believing that they were the new, the new Jerusalem here in, the, in America to bring about freedom and hope. It had been tied to it, and so it became no gospel at all. It was tied to pedigree and privilege and now listen, it's 2020. And just as the gospel loses its effectiveness when it loses its way, it is losing potentially effectiveness because <laughs> easily false things get attached to the good news of Jesus Christ. In the 1800s, the gospel became lost effectiveness because it was tied to false ideals and hopes and I see it happening today again. All through history, there's a temptation the enemy wants to, to make the gospel of Jesus be no gospel at all. I give you permission. We sang that. Gospel simply means good news, as I mentioned. Some Christians have tied the gospel to socialism. Some have tied the gospel. They can't see that it's not inextricably linked with capitalism. They can't see that. It's being tied to it. Others have tied the gospel to nationalism, that the success of our country or any country is also the success of Christianity and our faith in Jesus Christ. That's a false gospel. Some have tied the gospel to activism. Others have tied the gospel to denominationalism. And every time this happens, the gospel is distorted and it becomes no gospel at all. Do you see why Paul was writing with fervor? And do you see why the Holy Spirit might be directing our attention more deeply and opening our eyes so that we would walk out the true gospel? Hmm. It's good news. Now, Paul had been away from the churches in Galatia for only three years, but in that three years, a lot had taken place. He had to write sternly and with passion, and this is what he wrote. We, we, we read some of this, and now we'll read the, the rest of his thought here. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. You see the strong language. As we have said before, and I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel counter or contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. For for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He says, I, I, I seek to please God alone. And what is pleasing to God is this gospel of Jesus that has the hope for the world. So what happened? <laughs> so what happened? That's helpful for us. And we'll see ourselves in here a little bit as I answer the question that we posed. I told you last week we'd answer, who were the Galatians? What was going on? Why, why was it that they were tempted to have this gospel be distorted? There's three things to know about the Galatians. For those of you who are taking notes, the first thing to understand them and what was going on is that Galatia, was a nation and, and then it wasn't. <laughs> okay, so, so a little bit of history here about the, what is at the time of Paul's writing a province, but before that, it was actually, it was actually a nation established. So the region of Galatia at the time of Paul's writing was a Roman province in Asia Minor. You can see here on the screen the Roman Empire and its province within that. It was, you know, it's kind of like a state. It's kind of like a county. That's what a province is. But 300 years before Paul, the Gauls, a, a uh, Celtic people, had rebelled against Rome. And huge numbers of them, there's a repopulation to this area in Galatia. It was actually the nation of Galatia for a time before Rome eventually subdued it again and made it be... Um, 
this, this province or this kind of county of, of sorts. The reason I'm sharing this with you is to recognize that throughout history, borders have been established and there's been nations and then not nations and then they've been run over by other nations and the nation has expanded or hasn't become a nation and that is, that is the history of things and that's what's happening. And just like when that happens in, in our current times and there's uh, border disputes or new governments or whatever, there's a lot of disorder. It really informs how we feel and what we think about life. And that is certainly in their history and in their present reality as they were in the Roman Empire. <clears throat> so the second thing um, that is helpful for us to know is that Galatia, this region, was really important to the Roman Empire. It was kind of like one of their go-to that, that region really gets what we are all about. So notably, Poseidon Antioch was the principal city in the region of Galatia. And about 75 years before Paul came through, it was reestablished as a city where retired soldiers and officers of the Roman uh, army could settle. And so by the time of Paul, it was awash in empire and emperor worship. So the emperor at the time was Claudius. Everybody say Claudius. That's, that's who the empire is, who was a really effective administrator. He was kind of a reluctant um, emperor, but he was a very effective administrator who expanded the population of the Roman empire by 20% in his 15 year reign. So he stabilized the empire when famine hit by acquiring corn. And so he was somebody that, man, people look to. In other words, patriotism at this time for the Roman Empire, especially in this region of Galatia, was really high. For many, Rome was living up to its promise. Peace and prosperity. And this region of Galatia was awash in such heightened sentiments of the Roman Empire. So Paul Rush, he, N.T. Wright says that Paul was obviously he was like on a march, like the places he, he went were exactly like strongholds of the empire and he walked right into those places. He got himself in all kinds of trouble because he was speaking to these realities. <laughs> he marched right into such regions with a startling proclamation, Jesus is Lord. Now we say that and it doesn't, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it means like, oh God, I love you. Or we say Lord. <laughs> Lord God, you know, when we're praying, we, we repeat that phrase a lot, Lord God, Lord God. But for, for Paul to go into a city and to proclaim this was pretty dangerous stuff. N.T. Wright helps us to understand how subversive and daring Paul, Paul's words were. This is what he says. Everybody else in Saul's day, or Paul, in regions from Spain all the way to Syria, had to worship the goddess Roma in Kyrios Caesar, which means Lord Caesar. Augustus Caesar had declared that his late adoptive father, Julius Caesar, was now divine, thus conveniently acquiring for himself the title Divi Phileus, son of the deified one, or in Greek, simply Huas Thou, son of God, and his successors mostly followed suit. So Paul marches into the flag-draped, empire-soaked, ex-military city that was brimming with imperial Roman hope and says, the crucified Jesus is Lord. There can only be one Lord. And what he's saying is, Caesar isn't Lord. Whoo! Now, if you read the book of Acts, Paul is getting himself thrown in prison. Paul is getting beat. Paul has people opposed to him. Can you understand why? It wasn't he was saying, Jesus is Lord and he can save your soul so you can go to heaven one day. He was saying, Caesar isn't Lord. That will mess with things. Have you noticed how the... Our country gets really upset when people start messing with our national identity or sacred talismans like the flag. There's power that is being confronted when those things are suggested to not be as powerful or important as they should be in 
the eyes of a nation. That's what's happening with Paul. But he does it. Rome wanted peace, and supposed peace could only come when status quo was upheld. Status quo, keeping things just the way that they are. Status quo brought general security. But listen, status quo in the Roman Empire left women oppressed, left the poor even poorer. Slaves were still slaves. And it was only the threat of violence that kept supposed peace. Hence their practice of crucifixion, that Jesus died at the practice of crucifixion. Essentially, crucifixion, dying on a cross, prosecuting criminals publicly in a horrific manner of death. Sometimes they would take days to die. Was Rome saying over and over again, if you don't behave and you don't honor the empire and you don't honor the emperor Caesar, you will be snuffed out, sit down and shut up. And Paul comes in and says, no, Jesus is Lord. Here's Paul, Jesus is Lord. He's making a new humanity out of you. He's reconciling things, these things that have you broken. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord and he's lifting up the poor and he's humbling the rich. The Roman Empire was hugely hierarchical. The powerful deserve to be powerful. The slaves should be slaves and there's not really much in between. But here, this new community is tearing down the powers of those hierarchies and those aristocracies and it's messing with the social order and men and women are equally valuable and children are valuable. This is, the, this is the early church because Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. The third thing it's important to know, the Jews lived under special rules in Galatia. So in the book of Galatians, as we're gonna see, the Jews, the practice of circumcision, um, these people were becoming Christians, and a lot of the, the Jews were following Christ as well. And so now we have this community of uncircumcised and circumcised, and the Jews start saying, some of them start saying, the Judaizers, as, as Paul calls them, start demanding that if you become a Christ follower, you also have to be circumcised. So... That's a little backdrop there. But the Jews lived under special rules relative to the Roman Empire in Galatia. Special accommodations. They didn't have, the Jews did not have to participate with some Roman religious festivals. They were given some form of religious past. They had a religious freedom that others around them didn't. Then Paul comes in. He starts to preach this message about Jesus being Savior and Lord for all people. And that the old custom of circumcision was no longer necessary. So some Jews are embracing Jesus as their savior, as Lord, but this newfound freedom is creating tension with the local authorities. It's creating tension because now also some Gentiles are becoming Christian and mingling with this Jewish Christ-following community, and these Gentiles aren't being circumcised. And the Roman authorities start to think, wait a second. If the Jews aren't really Jews anymore because they're setting aside their customs, maybe you don't need these special permissions because what you're doing is upsetting some of the social political balance that we have here. There was a fear of them. This is why some people start to say they need to be circumcised because there was a fear that they would lose their special permissions and protections. Catch this, listen. Why were people starting to press against the real gospel? They were afraid of losing their religious freedom. Sound familiar? Man, the gospel, the Bible's right here in our midst. The gospel being distorted because some people think that our so-called tie to our national establishment and our religious freedoms are the most important thing and we need to fight and create a stink about it. Listen, Jesus didn't come so that we could have religious freedom. He came so that we can have freedom in him no matter what the circumstance around us. And as we, as we embrace that and we live that out, we will begin to experience what Paul writes in Philippians 4. He says, I have found the secret of being content whether I have little or whether I have none at all. The mystery is in within Christ Jesus. I do not 
not need to not be in prison or to be in prison. In either case, I am free in Christ. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. Woo. So some Jewish Christians started to proclaim to the Gentiles who trusted Jesus that they needed to honor the old customs, namely by being circumcised. But connecting the new Jesus followers with the old tradition of circumcise, circumcision would have created a misunderstanding of what Jesus came to do, a misunderstanding of the kind of community Jesus would create, and a move backward towards cultural or civic religion. And so Paul writes his corrective with force. He wanted nothing more than for every person to be able to access the astounding hope that Jesus brought. Hope to men, hope to women, hope to slaves, hope to free, hope for the Jew, hope for the Gentile. And that hope would unify them beyond the tenuous, fragile hopes of the empire. Does the Roman Empire still exist? No. Does Pax Ramona, the peace of Rome, exist? No. Does the church remain? Yes. Oh, foolish Americans, who has bewitched you? Maybe it is this Jesus that Bree is meeting. Each week we're adding on to an allegory that helps us to kind of process differently, not just thought, but story. This is Bree. The image of the man's smile was in Bree's mind as she awoke. Still on the side of the road and not down the river, she struggled to her feet and gazed down the slope towards the river. The rocky shore was there, the river was there, but there was no man and no campfire. Had it been a dream? Warily, she approached the river. Now on the shore, she looked more closely. There was no fire, no sign of a fire and no bacon. She looked down river. A faint trail followed the edge of the river around the next bend. She sat on a large round rock and thought. The river's rushing filled her ears, but as she closed her eyes, she felt peace. In her mind's eye, the man's eyes, in her mind's eye, the man's eyes met hers again. As she looked at him in her mind, she felt as though he was her father, he was a grandfather, he was a gentle doctor and a patient grade school teacher all at the same time. And his smile was earnest. Brie opened her eyes, surprised by how vivid her feelings were. It was like the instant feeling of freedom that one feels when you smell fresh cut grass or the first barbecue of the summer. That image in her mind meant so much in just a flash recall. She opened her eyes and said, what was that about? She muttered. What was what about? Bree jumped to her feet and swung her backpack in front of her as a shield. Ten feet away upriver, the smiling man was there. He wore faded jeans and looked ready for a hike with his light backpack and sturdy tan boots on. He opened his hands toward her and said, whoa, there, it's, it's okay. Instinctively, Bree stepped back. One step, another, then... Tripping over the round rock, she toppled and her world went black. The man moved swiftly. With precision, he lifted her off the rocks, cupped her bleeding head, and jogged toward the trail downriver. Along the trail, he whispered in a strange language. If you could understand these strange syllables, you would have heard an ancient prayer and promise. In our language, it is... In those days, when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, he will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land, which is Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14. Could it be that Jesus is taking us down a path that is foreign to us? Could it be off the beaten path of typical American dreams? Could it be that we are like Bree, lost, but willing to go where he wants? Could it be that there is a longing building in us for the true gospel of Jesus? 
Could it be that we are discovering the gospel beyond personal forgiveness? Perhaps we are discovering a Jesus that answers the tectonic issues of human existence. Rome had tried to answer them, but ended up with crosses and rebellions that violence could only snuff out, a violence that repulses us. The gospel of grace is not only about atonement and forgiveness through faith, but includes significant power to answer the questions that every empire or regime or group of people has been trying to answer. What is peace? What is unity? What is diversity? What is equality? What is provision? What is justice? What is hope? To pervert the gospel by adding anything to it is to relegate it to a cultural or religious artifact, powerless as except as it retains status quo, when in fact it is status quo that needs to be toppled so that a new hope can emerge. Rome, like all governments, was trying to maintain their fa fragile status quo and were threatened, not by the Jews, but by Jesus. The lordship of Jesus. Rome wanted Jews just to sit down and be good Jews. The Jews even wanted that because status quo is easier than the truth. I wonder about you and me. I wonder if we're willing to say yes to this epic Jesus that is pulling us out of all of these things and certainly pulling us out of status quo because as Donnie mentioned, look what status quo is getting us. Jesus came to create a new humanity. Under his lordship, which will break the status quo. Here's the application for this week. Read our daily devotions. You're going to be challenged this week. I encourage you, take a deep breath. Tomorrow's devotion actually will help you to be prepared, to be confronted with some false gospels that are resonant within our, within our society. But read them, participate. Participate with your community group. And, and thirdly, don't be distracted by the election. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope you voted. And, or, I mean, if you chose not to, it's not a big judgment thing. But, this, but man, th this feels like the thing. But this is the thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's discussion questions this week. Read Galatians 3. As a group, you're going to read Galatians 3, 28 through 29. If Galatians 3, 28 through 29 was the only scripture you had, what is the gospel? That would be a great conversation. And then you're going to read what we read this morning, Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Then you're going to define and do some homework before you go, what does status quo mean? You're going to draw parallels between the province of Galatia and our own present situation. And then you can answer a question about Bree. Bree felt drawn to this man in her mind's eye. How did she describe him? You have to go back and how did she describe him? What do you think she meant by those reflections? It is the crucified Jesus who holds the power to reconcile all people to himself and to each other. In communion, we celebrate and affirm that. It's a simple act. It feels small. It is small. But it reminds us time and time again when we see it through the lens of the true gospel, this is our only hope a humble king, a stooping king, a serving king, a king who sacrificed himself so that we might live in him, with him, and each other. So would you take out, and would you throw me a, <laughs> throw me one, this is cool. <laughs> Carefully open up that top, and for you at home, have your elements ready. Oof. Oh boy. Okay, I see. There we go. <laughs> this wafer 
Looks to be a zero calorie wafer. I don't know. <laughs> this is pretty. But this simply represents the body of Christ that reminds us that not, it didn't just happen. What happened with Jesus didn't just happen as an idea or something in the abstract or something in our, our minds, but actually his physical body was beaten and broken so that we can be healed and put back together. Would you hold that up and repeat after me? Jesus, this is your body broken for me. I receive of it. Take and eat. Throughout all of history, it has been the blood of men and women dying on the battlefields of nation against nation that have been the heroes of history. But Jesus came to have his blood spilled so that the shedding of blood no longer would be the hope of humanity. It would be his blood alone. Jesus said, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. And perhaps it was only after his resurrection from the dead that we could adequately understand that Jesus does not wish for us to lift our sword against our enemy, but rather to allow his final death to absorb our enemies into himself so that they can receive the forgiveness that we have too. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. So that which easily tempts you to play along the way of the world's power, we see it happening all over right now, coercion, force, violence, demonization, no longer has to be our way. But what is our way? Humbly serving others in love. Would you hold that, the blood of Christ up and repeat after me. Jesus, this is your blood. Pour it out for me poured out for all that we might have life and freedom truly in you. Take and drink. In those days when you pray, I will listen, says the Lord God of heaven's armies. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Please bring us home to you. Please reconcile us to you and to each other. We ask that you would heal the people of this land. And that can only happen through the gospel that you have given us. Help us to hold it sacred. Help us not to attach anything to it, but help us to proclaim with courage in the face of all that opposes us, Jesus alone is Lord. Would you take just one moment and gather your things? I'm about ready to release you and I want to say a blessing over you as you go. So would you gather your things and would you stand?
Would you receive this? Also from Paul in Ephesians 3, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. And may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. You are dismissed.